Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We're co-hosting this webinar with our friends at uh, NUS, the National Union of Students. Thank you so much for coming. Before we go further, I just want to acknowledge the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our um, Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters, our elders past, present and emerging. And given the context of today's discussion, I also want to make a special uh, reference to two members of the Indigenous community that identify as queer and LGBTQIA+. The reason for this webinar was twofold. One was we wanted to hear the stories and the voices of, of people part of that community and their great contributions. And it was in the context of knowing that churches have been very unwelcoming to people and they've missed out. Those churches have lost because they've missed out on having that great contribution from some great people. And so this is partly to kind of try to address that by giving a broader voice uh, to people in that community. And also to kind of lament just, just the, the damage that has been done by the church, by, by, by some churches and what they've missed out on, that, that enriching uh, experience they could have had if they were genuinely more welcoming. So we're gonna have some people presenting on some great people uh, in history and in, in, in current uh, history. Um, there'll be a time for, for sort of group discussions as well. Um, we'll finish uh, in, in under an hour. Um, so we'll start with uh, Jordy, please. Yeah. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for that. Um, so the first person I wanted to chat to chat about today is um, Sylvia Rivera. Um, so Sylvia was an American civil rights activist who advocated for gay rights. Um, and was particularly influential in the movement's early years. Um, so um, for those who might not know about Sylvia, um, she's a transgender woman um, who fought for the inclusion of transgender and other gender non-conforming people in the mainstream lesbian and gay uh, communities. Um, she was a tireless advocate for those silenced and disregarded by larger uh, movements and throughout her life fought against the exclusion of transgender people, um, especially transgender people of color um, from the larger movement for gay rights. Um, her story isn't an easy one. Um, so at a very young age, um, she was um, openly expressing herself. Um, and during the time of when she was young, um, it was the 1950s, so easy enough you could probably get the assumption that it wasn't an easy time to be out and about and to be who you are as a queer such LGBTQI plus person. Um, so with not having that acceptance and being someone who quite enjoyed um, wearing makeup, um, quite enjoyed um, pretty much cross-dressing, um, she had to run away from her own home and become homeless just to basically um, escape an environment where she just could not feel safe as an individual. Um, she, um, how, like, and this, like, was obviously quite damaging to herself, but um, in the end of the day, what happened was that she was able to be taken in by a local community um, and by a local community of drag queens who had become close friends at, with especially Marsha P. Johnson, who's also an African-American self-identified drag queen and activist. And um, something that Sylvia and Marsh were able to connect on um, was the fact that they were both battling exclusion in a movement for gay rights um, that did not embrace their gender expression as individuals. So Sylvia alongside uh, Marsha um, was actually actively involved in the Stonewall in Uprising, um, which for those who are unaware uh, is basically a bunch of, um, it was basically a, um, a movement that just sparked um, rel relatively during um, the early 1970s and just sort of it set a new tone for the gay rights movement towards the queer liberation movement um, and kind of set 
told the police who were being intimidating and using their um, their um, powers as an institution to abuse the queer the uh, queer people to, that basically just told them like it was queer people saying no this is enough um, so as part of that movement um, she resisted um, was very much heavily involved. Um, she resisted arrest and led a series of protests um, against the raids that were happening against queer people. Um, and obviously with Stonewall being such a turning point in the visibility of the gay rights movement and a start um, and being a sort of a sparking point and start of the first pride, pride, pride parades in the US, um, Sylvia, um, at, among with other people, um, whilst being very powerful advocates for gay rights uh, and the liberation movement, um, unfortunately were discriminated against and discouraged from um, participating. Um, and obviously with this being the case, Sylvia being a very vocal person and being a person who has had a passionate influence and advocacy towards the gay rights movement, um, it's decided um, to just ignore the fact that she was discriminated against and discouraged from participating from um, any pride movement um, and had decided in 1973 she'll go to a parade and um, even though she was denied to speak um, because of her the amount of work and advocacy she had done um, she decided to just grab a microphone and just tell spectators and other marchers that if it wasn't for uh, drag queens like herself, there'd be no gay queer, like gay um, liberation movement whatsoever. Um, so she was booed off stage, and during the 1970s, um, she was just fr frankly, frequently tangled with such um, with gay rights leaders who were hesitant to even include trans people in their advocacy work. So such as the Gay Activist Alliance, which formed a response to Stonewall and frankly rejected the role of transgender people like Sylvia um, at, and the majority of transgender people who were people of colour that have played a vital role in the uprising towards the queer, and towards the queer liberation uh, movement. So with the issue of acceptance um, of the transgender community, um, Sylvia is still being a passionate advocate. Um, she, worked along with Marsha Jean uh, P. Johnson, started the Street Transvestite Action Revolutions Group, which is just a group of space to organize and discuss issues facing the transgender community um, in New York City. Um, and they also had a building called Star House uh, that provided lodgings for those who really needed. So um, obviously at the, during those times, um, the those who identified as trans were often very much discriminated against. They didn't have the necessary support. Quite often um, they were known, uh, they would be kicked out of their home, like many queer people um, are still are today. Um, and even though Star was short-lived, her advocacy for the inclusion of transgender people in the gay rights movement had no bounds. So Sylvia also fought against the exclusion of transgender people um, from the Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act in New York City, which was an act that specifically discriminated people based on um, accessing education, um, accessing employment when they need to, um, on the basis of who they are and their sexual orientation. Um, so just to um, conclude, Rivera's lifelong activism and other efforts um, is really amazing because she helped put the tea in LGBT rights movement, um, expanding the right for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people and queer uh, queer rights. Um, she was the first people uh, to, well, one of the first people to highlight that the movement needed to be inclusive, and she was vocal about this. Um, she used her outsider status to help make change and was later honoured at the 25th anniversary of the celebration of the Stonewall in rights. Um, even with all the discrimination she faced and the advocacy she had to do. Uh, she's continued, like her legacy lives on basically 
um, through other projects um, that continue to advocate to remove the discrimination, um, harassment and violence of the transgender community. Um, and basically, yeah, that um, pretty much sums up Sylvia Rivera for me. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jordy. Uh, can we please hear from Bridge? Yes, once I work out how to turn off my mute. Um, yeah, thank you so much for putting this all together and for approaching us to come and chat to you about um, some cool LGBTQIA plus people from history. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So kind of immediately left at the opportunity, but um, had a fair bit of trouble, I guess, kind of narrowing um, narrowing two people down, um, but I did manage to in the end. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna start by saying, um, oh, first of all, yeah, I'm, um, my name's Bridge. I use they, them, or he, him pronouns, either are fine. Um, I'm a proud transmasculine non-binary person and I'm calling in today from um, WA on Wajak Noongar land. And um, yeah, I think our, um, our queer history is often really inextricably linked to religion and spirituality. And um, I think the more that we can kind of look into this and acknowledge the shared history, the better that we can work towards um, a stronger sort of future together where our communities can respect and affirm each other and really um, like cherish and celebrate the people who are living at their intersections. Um, so I, as I said, I yeah had a I had a bit of trouble um, narrowing narrowing down who I was going to do for today, but um, I did manage to get there and found um, a couple of people who particularly sort of resonated with me and who I think really fully represent that shared history um, that I was just mentioning. So the first person that I'm going to talk about is the Public Universal Friend. Um, so the Public Universal Friend was an American preacher who was born in nine, uh, sorry, 1752 in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Um, they were assigned female at birth and initially given the name Jemima Wilkinson. They were the eighth child of Amy and Jeremiah Wilkinson, who were both Quakers. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar, Quakers belong to a sect of Protestant Christianity, um, and they're um, formally known as the Religious Society of Friends. In, um, in 1776, at the age of 24, the public universal friend fell extremely ill with what was most likely typhus and was bedridden for some time at near death with a high fever, which are circumstances under which people very regularly died at the time. Um, however, after several days of being on a death watch, the friend's um, fever broke and they um, claimed that uh, Jemima Wilkinson had died and her soul had ascended to heaven. The public universal friend claimed that upon death, Jemima Wilkinson had received revelations from God through two archangels who proclaimed that there was room, room, room in the many mansions of eternal glory for thee and for everyone. Um, the public universal friend claimed that the body of Jemima Wilkinson had died and had been reanimated with a new spirit um, charged with preaching his word. And from that day forth, they refused to answer to their dead name, ignoring or chastising anyone who insisted upon using it, um, identified as neither male or female, um, asked not to be referred to with traditionally gendered pronouns, and asked simply to be referred to as the public universal friend, Puff, or simply the friend. Um, after this, the friend began to travel and preach throughout the nearby US states. Um, beginning to draw quite large audiences at their worship meetings, um, during which they would typically recite um, very long passages of the Bible verbatim from memory. Um, their followers began to form a congregation of so-called universal friends, um, making the friends one of the earliest known white Americans to form a recognized religious community within the country. Um, most of the Universal Friends were from Quaker backgrounds themselves, but um, the mainstream Quaker movement at the time disowned the public Universal Friend and their siblings who traveled with them um, and disciplined members who attended the Friends meeting or meetings. Um, by the mid 1780s, popular newspapers and pamphlets had begun covering the Friends sermons, 
um, with some being particularly critical. And um, this criticism almost exclusively related to the Friends gender nonconformity rather than their teachings, which were for the most part um, essentially identical to the mainstream Quaker teachings of the time. Um, to the point that one of the two publications that the friend released throughout their life was a direct plagiarism from Quaker teachings. Um, in line with some of these more traditional um, teachings at the time, the friend rejected um, ideals of predestination and election, um, believing that anyone, regardless of gender, uh, could gain access to God's light and pre um, preached the possibility of universal salvation, essentially the belief that all sinners, no matter the sin, would eventually be reconciled to God. Um, the friend was really outspoken on the abolition of slavery and um, successfully persuaded several members of their congregation who kept slaves at the time to free them. Um, they preached humility and hospitality towards everyone, um, kept their meetings open to the public fully, including those who were just curious and wanted to come along and see what the deal was. Um, they openly welcomed members of Indigenous and Black communities, which at the time was um, a, a pretty big deal. Um, and yeah, they um, did still hold quite traditional views of marriage and celibacy, um, but sort of maintained that neither was essential. Um, and they welcomed a significant number of unmarried women into their congregation. Um, in fact, the closest sort of rank of followers were a group of about four dozen unmarried women who came to be known as the Faithful Sisterhood. Um, and took up leadership roles within the congregation that would have traditionally been reserved for men. Um, the preacher asserted that women should obey God rather than men, um, and the proportion of households headed by women in the society's eventual religious settlements was significantly higher than any others around them at the time. Um, the Society of Universal Friends ran into some significant legal trouble while attempting to secure land for their religious settlements, and in 1799, a group of disillusioned former followers um, attempted to have the friend arrested for blasphemy. Um, an officer tried to seize the friend while they were out horse riding, but as a keen equestrian, they were able to escape. Um, and after a couple more um, arrest attempts, the friend eventually appeared in a court in June 1800 where it was found that no indictable offence had been committed and they were actually invited to deliver a sermon to those present in the court. Um, at around the turn of the century, the friend's health began declining and they eventually passed on June 1st, 1819. Um, and yeah, the, um, I think with particularly within the context of America, the, the friend's impact on society um, from both a queer and a religious historical sense uh, was profound and they've retroactively become known as one of the earliest publicly identifying gender diverse people in America. So I will pass on for now. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, Bridge. Can we please hear from Melody, who has a more modern yeah. person? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Bridget, and Julie, for sharing those. Um, so I'm going to bring it forward to the present day a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our favorite gay icons, Lady Gaga. So I'm sure I don't need to introduce who she is, but just for the sake of it, I will. Um, so Lady Gaga is a American singer, songwriter, and actress. Um, she was more popular in the sort of early 2010s pop music time. So she had hits such as Poker Face, Just Dance, Bad Romance, we all know them, we love them, you know, super fun songs to dance to and sing along to at karaoke. And more recently, her acting career has sort of taken off with movies like A Star is Born and more recently House of Gucci. And she was also raised Roman Catholic and actually attended a private all-girls Catholic school in her youth. And she is also a bisexual woman. So one of the things I really love about Lady Gaga is she is a huge, huge, huge uh, proponent of LGBTQ rights and activism. She's known as a gay icon of the LGBTQ community. Um, her songs often feature messages of self-love and radical acceptance. And she has supported gay rights publicly as early as I think, 2008 or even earlier than that. 
Um, one of my favorite songs by her is Born This Way, which um, I'll just read some quick lyrics. Uh, no matter gay, straight, or bi, lesbian, transgender life, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to survive. And so she really has, that song was released in what, like 2008, and gay marriage wasn't legalized in the US until 2015. And there really wasn't many transgender rights or public acknowledgement of transgender identities until super recently even because we had policies such as don't ask don't tell in place where you couldn't even talk about your transgender identity and you know more recently younger generations have been you know more a lot more inclusive and accepting you know people ask for pronouns when they introduce themselves in classes and stuff like that which has been a huge step forward but you know lady gaga has been on top of it since 2008 and you know i was only what like six years old back then and i wouldn't have even known that this was a thing at that point but she was already singing about it which was really great and she also started the born this way foundation which is a nonprofit which focuses on youth empowerment and mental health and has started and supported many causes relating to those issues including supporting lgbtq youth and um, funding all these programs across the United States to sort of spread um, knowledge and education about these subjects. And she actually credits a lot of her early success in her career to her LGBTQ fans who sort of embraced her sort of wild, wacky thingness and her crazy outfits and her songs and took her in. Um, Lady Gaga is also Christian. She was raised Catholic. So in songs, she does make mention of God, which I think is super cool because she has this message of radical acceptance. She is a bisexual woman and she is still a faithful Christian. Um, she sings about God making no mistakes in Born This Way. She sings about praying in a million reasons and about you know giving her life to God and following the Lord's path. And um, a quick quote from her, she says, I am a Christian woman and what I do know about Christianity is that we bear no prejudice and everyone is welcome. So Lady Gaga is just a really clear picture of how, you know, sexuality and gender identity doesn't have to be at a crossroads with faith and being a Christian. You know, you can be a Christian and not be prejudiced, you can be a Christian and still be accepting of other people and loving of other people. And I think that Lady Gaga in her songs and singing about how, you know, God makes no mistakes when he makes us how as we are is just one really great picture of being Christian and also a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you for that, Melody. Could we please hear from Geordie again? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, so the final person I wanted to talk about today is uh, Mark Ashton. Um, so for those who might not know, uh, Mark is a political activist um, who um, based it was born in Ireland. Um, he um, is well in well, he his story is quite known to a lot of people now because a movie is based on it um, called Pride. Um, so for those who are unaware uh, about Pride, um, what that is, is a movie. Um, it's about a movie on um, a support group called um, Gays and Lesbians um, Supporting Mine Workers um, who decide to support um, the mining union at the time um, who um, were in industrial action um, and had stopped working due to um, a conflicts that were happening at, with the government. Um, so to give you a bit of a context about Mark himself. Um, so Mark, um, as I said, is a political activist. Um, he was someone who was very much involved with the um, nuclear disarmament movements are very passionate about ensuring um, that the 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 dis this disarmament of nuclear weapons 
um, and ensuring a peaceful world for all. Um, he was very passionate about um, LGBT issues. Um, so in particular, he did feature in a, um, a documentary uh, which featured um, young lesbian and gay um, people um, called Framed Youth, Revenge of the Teenage Perverts. And this was just sort of a film that uh, basically interviewed, was conducted with straight people um, about their views on homosexuality and gay and lesbian people talking about their own lives and experiences. Um, and sort of this kind of, um, this film kind of gave Mark a bit more of a lens as to um, sort of seeing, he sort of describes it as the naivety uh, regarding the police as an institution. So at that time as well, um, the police were obviously um, a heavy institution that the government used to discriminate against communities, um, such as the LGBT community. Um, so he found it very eye-opening um, to sort of see um, the fact that the mistreatment and vilification that occurred from the police movement. Um, but moving besides that point, um, what happened with Mark during his years is that um, he very much was an activist. So he um, very much tried to fit outside the norm. Um, for, for instance, he in, back in the day, there are records um, saying that he worked at a conservative bar um, and was actually uh, someone who dressed up as drag and people didn't actually know if he was a man or a woman. Um, so he's just fighting the norms of the time and just essentially um, basically expressing himself, like having a good time, you know. Um, he, um, he went overseas to Bangladesh and sort of saw the issues over there. Um, relating around workers' issues and workers' rights. And um, he saw um, a lot of, and reflected on this and as to why, um, like he needs to be vocal about political issues, why it was really mattered to um, sort of look from that lens. It sort of sparked something in him and say, well, he needs to be more vocal. He needs to ensure that those who don't necessarily have a voice have a voice. Um, so continuing on from that um, and this spark, he was very much active in his local community and decided to help um, with organisations like Switchboard, which obviously provides a lot of important work um, towards supporting LGBT young folk um, in their experiences as individuals uh, dealing with um, struggles of identity, but also like trying to um, ensure that they feel supported no matter what. Um, so Mark, obviously, Mark um, being the activist he was, he went to, I believe, sort of like a Labor Day march um, and essentially spoke to one of the mine, uh, mine worker um, and was sort of impressed when he spoke to the mine worker about the similarities that there were about um, the ongoing issues impacting um, the mine workers and how relevant it was actually to LGBT people as well. Um, and as, as you would assume, like all what this did was basically um, Mark decided to form um, gays and lesbians um, supporting uh, mine workers. And this was obviously a very important movement at the time because um, Matter of fact is, is what Mark did was basically build blocks to ensure the, like to address any ongoing issues um, and similarities and stand in solidarity with the minor workers, um, which is very important because at the time the minor workers really did not have any support. They had no money really coming in. They, um, the, the, gay, the gay and lesbian um, supporting mine workers movement basically um, expanded around the country and just like fundraise to ensure like these mine workers had the financial support um, because like it just wasn't fair that they thought uh, it wasn't fair that these people weren't earning an income and wasn't fair like basically because the government was mistreating them at the time. Um, I guess what 
this story and what the significance is, is really matter of fact is this Mark was able to identify um, the intersectionality of key issues. Um, he was like, his legacy was basically identifying the fact that um, there's like, well, most people have somewhat, some sort of similarities. Um, he was able to reflect and just say, um, because the statistics at the time was like, uh, supposedly one in five people are gay, basically. Um, like, I don't know if that's actually true, but like, you know, um, matter of fact is, it's like he, like he said, oh, well, if there's one in five gay people, there's got like, uh, there has to be one in five gay minors so we need to be in solidarity with them, you know, or like show that support. Um, so really, yeah, the end, the end of the day, what matters is like Mark's activism really left an impact because he really uh, demonstrated the point of solidarity, the point of intersectionality and really just being vocal on issues, but making sure that communities stick together. So like if there's one issue that a community's um, going through, then they should be supported no matter what, or be like, we should all work together to address it. Um, Mark's obviously been very much recognised for his work. Um, he unfortunately did pass away from AIDS, but he um, he has been embraced and really significantly remembered as like for his influence and what he has done in the UK to inspire people and their political activism towards like the queer liberation movement. But yeah, making sure that um, <laughs> no worries, <Des. laughs> Um basically making sure that the issues are really address and pretty much being an advocate for all. So yeah, th that sort of briefly sums up about Mark and sort of his contributions and sort of like talks about his um, ongoing um, like legacy of really making sure that providing a voice and platform where necessary and really just the point of what solidarity means is working with other communities and really standing up front when there's injustices there so yeah thank you so much for that uh geordie could we please hear from bridge again yeah thanks for that geordie and um, if anyone hasn't seen pride i very very highly recommend it because it's an amazing movie um cool okay I'll move on to my second person um and just before i do i'll give a small disclaimer that um in this section, I will use some kind of um, what's now considered outdated language that we wouldn't tend to apply to trans people nowadays. Um, obviously, these are terms that some people will still use to describe themselves, um, and self-identification is obviously still the most important thing to respect. Um, but I'm just flagging that some of the terms that I'm going to use aren't ones that we would typically use and aren't ones that um, are ones that I'm using because they were the way that the person described themselves at the time rather than the way they might describe themselves now. Um, so moving forward a couple hundred years from my last profile, um, Louis Graydon Sullivan, or Lou, was born in 1951 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was the third of six children born to a highly religious Catholic family and attended Catholic primary and secondary schooling. Um, from a very young age, Lou began to journal his thoughts, many of which expressed a profound underlying knowledge that he was a boy, um, sexual fantasies of being a gay man, um, and a confusion about his identity that would stay with him through his adolescence and into his early adulthood. In 1966, at the age of 15, Lou wrote, I want to look like what I am, but I don't know what someone like me looks like. I mean, when people look at me, I want them to think there's one of those people that has their own interpretation of happiness. That's what I am. Um, by 1973, at the age of 22, Lou began to openly identify as a female transvestite, and a couple of years later began to identify as a female to male transsexual. By 1975, it had become apparent to Lou that he needed to leave Milwaukee to find some way he could more openly express his gender identity and access the um, medical transition options that he'd realized that he needed. Um, he decided to move to San Francisco um, and reassuringly, his parents both fully supported him and gifted him with a handsome men's suit 
and his grandfather's pocket watch as going away gifts. Um, the role of supportive parents and social networks in otherwise unsupportive environments cannot be overstated even now. Um, we see this all the time in queer people who are raised in otherwise unsupportive environments and will receive just one, even just one um, sort of supportive adult or supportive like kind of place to go. Um, and that can literally make the hugest difference. Um, in his personal life, Lou began um, living as an out gay man and um, is still to this day cited as one of the first known transgender men to openly identify as gay. Um, at the time, heterosexuality was considered a requirement for accessing um, a lot of gender affirming care, but specifically surgery. Um, meaning trans feminine people were expected to be attracted to men and trans masculine people were expected to be attracted to women. Um, and so Lou's repeated denial of gender affirming surgery on the basis of his attraction to men led him to engaging in some of his earliest activism <clears throat> um, by launching a campaign to remove heterosexuality as a requirement to access gender affirming surgery. This led Lou to lobbying the American Psychiatric Association and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health um, to recognize his existence and that of many others as a gay trans man. He was one of the first trans men to be a peer counselor at the Yanis Information Facility, a center for trans issues. Um, he played a key role in helping trans mask folks access peer-led support and counseling, trans-friendly endocrinolo endocrinological um, services, hormone therapy, and gender-affirming surgery outside of gender dysphoria clinics. In 1976, um, Lou experienced a brief crisis of identity and went back in the closet for a few years, um, living as a heterosexual woman, um, before finally being able to access um, affirming doctors and therapists in around 1979, who recognized his identity and allowed him to begin testosterone therapy. A year later, he underwent a double mastectomy, and in 1986, he underwent bottom surgery, making him possibly the first out gay trans man to achieve access to it. Um, unfortunately, in the same year, Lou tested positive for HIV and was told that he may only have around 10 months to live. Um, and this was around when he was attributed with one of his most famous quotes, um, I took a certain pleasure in informing the gender clinic that even though their program told me I could not live as a gay man, it looks like I'm going to die like one. Um, however, this dire prognosis did uh, little but to further motivate Lou towards activism and peer support. Um, he became a founding member of the GLBT History um, Historical Society, which continues to compile and archive queer history to this day. Um, in December 1986, he started hosting a support group for trans men in San Francisco, the first of its kind, um, and this group eventually became FTM International, which is one of the largest organizations of its kind and still runs today and provides vital support to trans men all around the world. Um, he left us with the first known guide for trans masculine people accessing medical intervention. Um, and his writings and excerpts from his journal um, are some of the first of their kind that we now have access to. While he significantly outlived his initial prognosis of 10 months, Lou passed away from AIDS-related complications on March 2nd, 1991. The impact that he's had on the queer community and particularly the still underrepresented transmasculine community um, can't be overstated, and the number of transgender lives his work has assisted are innumerable. Um, I'm incredibly proud to share a community with um, some of the people um, that we've been discussing so far here today, and I just wanted to say thank you again for letting me the um, giving me the opportunity to come here and talk about them a bit. Well, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for that. Before we have a, sort of a general discussion about the people with, that you've talked about um, or questions you have, I just wanted to sort of focus specifically on the church and just sort of get your views on when, what is your, uh, when people say to you, why doesn't the church like you? Why aren't they welcoming? What, what, what do you think? Because obviously for someone like me who is in the church, I hear certain things, but I'm just curious for people who perhaps are not as involved in the church, what is their, what is your opinion on why they are not welcoming? And that's a question to any, to, to any of you. I 
I think um like my my personal experience has been um within like the Catholic education system where um there was just sort of a really huge culture of just not talking about it and that information just not getting out and I think um information and education is you know pretty much the first point of call for anything like that um I think there's honestly for the most part like obviously sort of a stigma and like a history of discrimination um but I think yeah a lot of it is around around talking about it and around sort of getting that information out there for everyone involved um for sort of both sides of that um that kind of equation um and my experiences I guess sort of as a as an adult have been more um experiencing a lot of acceptance from individual members of churches um and a lot of kind of like being told a lot that there was a lot of kind of desire within a lot of church communities to be more inclusive and to really like address some of these issues but there being sort of like structural or kind of traditional issues that may get in the way um but yeah I mean I think yeah for, for me it just still kind of comes comes down to to education so for you going through this that system and then not wanting to talk about it kind of sent that message that this is not something we want to talk about or embrace uh, mm -hmm. and then it's interesting what you said about there are individuals who come forward saying that we do want to love everyone and everyone means everyone but there's those structural um issues that uh, get in the way um could i ask melody with with um churches when, when you ask people you know, about the church, why doesn't the church like them? What is the sort of go-to uh, comment? Is it, well, you know, the, the church is condemned as publicly or they keep quoting this particular verse in the Bible or just look at the history of the, of, of the church? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of the things you mentioned. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, tradition and history, like, because there is this long like centuries steeped idea that you know you can't be gay or you can't be trans and be christian because that's like so weaved into christianity and the church's history you know christians are just afraid to sort of challenge that because it's a lot of you know follow what the bible says you know follow what your pastors tell you and a lot of pastors will just go to the same seminaries that tell the same thing over and over and repeat these same like copy passages and verses that just say that you know you can't be these two things um so I think that because of that it just like drives people away it drives LGBTQ people of faith away even if they are you know genuinely believing in God you know they won't want to be part of the church because it's so publicized that the church is not accepting. Um, and some people in the church are accepting, but it's a, a really big local, maybe minority, maybe majority, maybe somewhere around 50% that is saying like, you know, you can't be these two things, you know, we hate gay people and all this stuff. And so because of that really, really vocal part of the church, I think a lot of LGBTQ people are just like, okay, well, I'm just gonna give up on faith because it's too hard to sort of find that reconciliation. And you know, you certainly can't blame them for choosing that path. And if somebody says to you, Melody, it's in the Bible, you, you know, you can't be gay, you can't be lesbian, you can't be trans, uh -huh. what's your response? Um, read a different Bible. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> No, that's a good that's a good response uh, did anyone else have a an answer to kind of like what their what why they think the church doesn't like them or what they've heard or what their perception is Jordy, did you have some, some, something to add to that <clears throat> um not too much because like i think both bridge and melody really do hit it on the spot around the sort of um issues around it um i think myself like i did like similar to bridge i came from a catholic education just like um and um basically um very rarely 
or I can't even remember moments where like um, sexuality was talked about or like gender expression was talked about at all, like very big issues. Um, I think as well, because I came from a religious family a, a long time ago. Oh, like they're still religious. So I'm not so much, unfortunately. Um, it like I decided to sort of n not believe or not approach the religion because matter of fact, it's just like, I just saw a lot of ongoing issues and I saw that like basically the church wasn't vocal on them or wasn't essentially like really there to promote the love and acceptance that they're meant to be, you know. Um, matter of fact is it's like it's been an ongoing battle where um, people say, oh, we love you, we appreciate you, but then essentially you turn, you turn like, if they keep, they say that and then there's some sort of issue that happens with a specific individual or like or like a service provider, for instance, where a queer person's been facing homeless, but they've been turned around, like turned around because of like who they are, because then like of the religious beliefs of the institution, you know? Um, and like, I know that this doesn't obviously reflect the church and or like religion in its entirety. There's obviously great people um, involved and very accepting, you know, but like I think seeing those moments or hearing about them really does put um, a very inflecting message that, oh, okay, it's an us and them moment. It's a um, it's a thing where um, essentially the church is meant to be a big community, you know, um, and you like with having an us and them moment, it really does not show really the love and acceptance that. Um, is really meant to be promoted or like it's like it, that I have in the past or very much know that are talked about in the Bible, you know, um, like it's a, it's very conflicting relationship, but like, yeah, it's just such a hard thing to do, but it's just, yeah, there's a lot of work that really does need to happen around the area area around queer acceptance so yeah. <laughs> indeed thank you for thank you for uh, sharing that so now to the broader kind of discussion does anyone have any questions or comments about the people that they heard or honorable mentions that they thought about during the discussion that they want to get out there melody were you surprised by the the a lot of the us references a little bit to be honest a little bit <laughs> But you know, I, I won't argue. <laughs> Bridge, did you have any sort of uh, questions or comments about some of the other people that you heard about? No, I don't think so. Just, yeah, really appreciate, um, yeah, the additional information that I've got today. Um, definitely, yeah, recommend um, if anyone's interested in reading more about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, um, very, very cool sort of period of history and really instrumental to sort of our entire rights movement. Um, so it was really great to hear Jordy covering covering some of that. Um, and Mark Ashton as well is one of my favorite sort of um like figures from queer history. So yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it was really, really interesting to hear. And um loved all the loved the Lady Gaga um spot I, again like very big fan and was really really awesome to sort of hear a bit more about that and kind of your take on the music thanks for that uh Jordy, you mentioned solidarity that that was a big kind of theme uh why what's stopping us doing that more because I, I'm, I'm thinking again of another us reference sorry melody about uh, what was going on with immigration at the border and that there was uh, members of the asian community uh coming forward saying that we remember what happened in World War II when we were rounded up and put in cages. So that solidarity um, is why we're here because we know what it's like. And so we care about um, what's happening at, at the border. And, and then talking about miners, what Geordie said about, you know, some of these miners were part of our community. So we want to be in solidarity with them. What's getting in the way of, of solidarity? Is it just human nature? It's just difficult to really care about other people or is, is there a way to get there? And, you know, to have that solidarity with everybody. Yeah. Oh, God, that's going to be a very broad and, like, intense thing. Um, 
I mean, like solidarity is very important. And I mean, there's obviously a, so many different approaches to it, especially nowadays, since we've got like online platforms such as like social media, uh, where people sort of like, it, people might get like, sort of like criticized and say, it's not really doing much, et cetera. But really what I think the key thing about solidarity is really um, either if you like not there in the moment just sort of like showing that you are wanting to put your support behind it because that really like it's providing a message it's providing essentially being there um I think people um especially in the past um like and like I said there's been issues with police as an institution you know um I think people have been afraid to sort of show their solar solidarity or go or go against like classic institutions where it's often where um you have to face like like you can be vocal about the issue but you'll face jail you know or um matter of fact is it's like there's been those ongoing issues where um people are afraid to say something because um, they've been silenced to the point where it's just basically, um, matter of fact, it's just like, we can't, like, it's just such a big issue. <laughs> um, and uh, um, kind of, yeah, like, I think really the importance of solidarity is really just addressing like the intersectionality or being there and being at the moment or being like a vocal voice. Like sometimes what you're doing with providing solidarity is really just like sparking inspiration for those who really need it. Um, so like, especially those who are really um, silenced and marginalized. Like there's, for instance, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Interphobia and Transphobia is coming up in um, about 10 days. Um, and matter of fact, it says a lot of people are going to provide a lot of messages of love and acceptance, you know, or like show that solidarity with the community because like it, in, in the end of the day, um, the queer community has faced the discrimination of where homosexuality was treated as a disease, um, basically trans, like, um, being trans was um, treated as a disease, you know, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, it's just really important just to um, be out there if you can and just really have your voices heard because in the end of the day, what you're doing is like, um, whether it's just simply writing to MP, you know, or like talking to others about it, it is spreading the message. It is making it clear. It is really just showing that you just like, uh, it can also just show that you are providing a message of support to anyone that's part of that marginalized community or might socialize with any community you know um basically that it's just really it, it's powerful just to demonstrate where um it's connected as happens and how important it is to be there for people so yeah well, thank you for that that was brilliant uh, does anyone have a, any other comments on solidarity if not, can I just mention something else you said, Geordie, about how one of the people you mentioned didn't feel accepted as part of a group that was advocating um, for, for more rights. And it made me think of uh, Melody and, and civil rights, because I was surprised to learn that during the civil rights movement, um, there were uh, gay members saying that they were not welcome within that civil rights uh, movement and I just thought it's how ironic to be campaigning for the rights of people and then to turn around and say oh yes but we're still going to discriminate against you why do we have that mind side and th th we always seem to have it so you know ancient Greece oh yes democracy for a man what about a woman well no why do we why do we have that mind side and that could be a question to any of you or Melody or um, I mean I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I just think it's, I don't know. It's a great question because, you know, there are also um, in the US, we have this term called TERFs. I don't know if that's a thing in Australia, but it's like trans exclusionary radical feminists, which basically feminists that exclude trans women, unfortunately in, the, in Australia as well, right? Um, but I think it's just, a, I think maybe it's just, it's a little hard to say, but maybe it's just a little steeped in wanting 
power, you know, human desire for being above people or being better than people, maybe not human nature, but just some people always feel like they need to be better than other people. And so even if they're preaching this message of, you know, civil rights or accepting these other people, they'll find another group to be like, oh, but not you guys. You know, we were talking about us, but not you. And it's that big picture of, you know, barriers and, you know, separating groups and separating people by their differences instead of saying, hey, we're more alike than we are different. Um, so I think it's just, you know, it sucks, quite frankly, that that's a thing, but it is a thing. And it's just something that I think we need to overcome as, you know, as the human race as a whole is just finding ways that we are more similar to each other than we are different because we are and the sooner that we all realize and accept that the sooner that we'll learn to love each other better and accept each other better indeed and can i ask a question to, uh, to bridge uh you mentioned about structural issues do you have any maybe i won't use the word faith uh, that the structure will change or are we going to have this you know 100 years from now we're going to have the same issue there'll be some individuals who are who love everybody and then, but the institution of say the church will still be that you're not welcome i really hope not um and i think like <clears throat> as i've kind of said um i know a lot of people who are sort of very active within religious spaces who are really sort of doing what they can to kind of combat some of that um it's i think one of those areas where change can definitely be slow um but i yeah i do have a lot of hope for the fact that it is kind of getting better. We're seeing, I think, more and more um, churches and more and more religious groups kind of coming out in support of the community um, and really starting to kind of try and address some areas that need to be. Um, so yeah, I do have a lot of hope that hopefully within within the next hundred years, we, we won't, won't still be needing to worry about these things. Uh, and, and Melody, from a US perspective, do you have the same kind of hope that, uh the institution will change? Um, yeah, I do. I think a lot of the younger, a lot of my faith comes from, maybe not faith, a lot of my hope for the future uh, comes from, you know, seeing younger generations like my generation and the people around me at school sort of being that sort of radical level of accepting. Um, yeah, like my program in school, we, I believe we have a majority of people that are part of the LGBTQ community, which is kind of weird, but also very cool at the same time, because, you know, we're finally in the majority for once. Um, but I do have a lot of faith just because younger people are getting more accepting and getting louder about it. You know, they'll go throw riots in the streets about acceptance, which is really awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm mindful of the time. So thank you all again for, for joining and sharing and, and talking about something that is a very personal uh, to many of you. Um, for those who didn't speak, I hope you, you, you got something out of it and, and, and you like being part of it. We like having you part of it. Um, thank you again.